Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Legends of the Jedi. In our last episode, we finished off the Dark Lords of the Sith story arc. We saw Ula Keldroma's disastrous attempt to infiltrate the Krath and learn their dark side secrets. In the words of Obi-Wan Kenobi, he became the very thing he swore to destroy. At the end of the Dark Lords arc, Exar Kun was anointed as the new Dark Lord of the Sith by the spirit of Marka Ragnos. Ulik was named as his apprentice. Nomi Sunrider and the other Jedi Knights were forced to flee Sinagar after their multiple unsuccessful attempts to extract Ulik and bring him home. So our new story arc is called the Sith War, but before we jump into it, let's talk a bit about the background. The Sith War is comprised of six comic issues. Today we'll be covering the first two of those issues. Originally, I was going to cover three issues, but the events in the story arc cannot be understated. This arc really is the culmination of the Tales of the Jedi series, and so we need to take our time with it. So the series itself ran from August 1995 to January 1996. Kevin J. Anderson wrote the entire arc. Dario Carrasco Jr. is responsible for penciling each of the issues. And if you're wondering where this arc sits within the wider Tales of the Jedi storyline, well, we're in the penultimate arc. After the Sith War, we have one more Tales story arc before we move on to some bridging content, and then finally, Knights of the Old Republic. Now let's talk about the chronology. The original publication dates this story to 3990 BBY, or before the Battle of Yavin. That's the battle that we see in Star Wars Episode Four. But the new essential chronology later corrects the date to 3996 BBY. If you remember in episode 9 of the podcast, I told you that the preceding arc, Dark Lords of the Sith, takes place in 3997. So this arc takes place in the next year. All this is to say is that if you see the year 3990, it's not correct. In the official Legends continuity, for all intents and purposes, this story takes place 3,996 years before Star Wars Episode 4. So now that we've gotten those preliminaries out of the way, let's jump into our T-16 Skyhoppers and go bullseye some Womp Rats. Issue 1 of the Sith War is entitled Edge of the Whirlwind. The opening scrawl, which provides a nice recap of recent events, tells us the following. It has been six months since the former enemies Exar Kun and Ulik Keldroma have joined forces, forced into a common goal by hypnotic visions of a reborn Golden Age of the Sith. Through his dabblings in forbidden teachings, Kun has fallen completely under the spell of the ancient Sith ways, and he knows he must gain additional disciples to fan the flames of his planned victory. Meanwhile, in the iron-walled city of Sinagar, Ulik has stumbled down the dark path. Driven by a distorted need to avenge the murder of his beloved master Arka, poisoned by dark Sith toxins and seduced and manipulated by his wily lover Alima, his mission is to gather an army awesome enough to take on even the mighty Galactic Republic. But as their plans proceed, far from the watchful eyes of the Jedi Knights, other vicious crusaders enter the galactic stage. The issue opens in on a space battle taking place in the Empress Tita system. The masked warrior clans of Mandalore, yes you heard that right, Mandalore, are attacking a Tetan carbonite smelter aboard their basilisk war droids. We're told that the Mandalorians are fierce, proud, unbeaten and that their war droids are deadly semi-intelligent assault mounts bristling with weapons. In the middle of the battle, a mysterious mass figure muses on his motivations. My warriors need another crusade. The Empress Tita system is in chaos, overstretched by their many conquests. The Witch Elima and her Jedi devotee Ulic Keldroma will fall under the fist of Mandalore. So here we're introduced to Mandalore the Indomitable and with it comes our first introduction to the Mandalorians in this era of Legends continuity. One thing you should know is that the Mandalorian clans of the time were not human. They were largely comprised of a humanoid species known as the Tong. Now the Tong were a race that was originally native to Coruscant in the Legends continuity. After centuries of warfare, the Tong were eventually driven from Coruscant by the other dominant species of the planet, the human battalions of Zell. After a millennia of exile, the Tong were led by the legendary Mandalore I to conquer a planet which he named Mandalore after himself. According to legend, Mandalore I conquered the planet of Mandalore sometime in the thousands of years that preceded this story. While we don't have an exact date, probably lost to time, we're told that this all occurred somewhere between 24,000 years and 7,000 years before Episode 4. So yeah, ancient history. 
Then, in the period between 7000 and 3996, when our current story takes place, another individual took up the title of Mandalore and styled himself Mandalore the Conqueror. He was responsible for expanding the resources and territory of the Mandalorians, and also formally established the Mandalorian Crusaders. So this guy that we're talking about today is yet another Mandalore, Mandalore the Indomitable. He's sporting an unmistakably yet ancient-looking Mandalorian helmet, and like his forebears, he's taken up the title as the leader of the Mandalorian people. So back to our story. We can see that the Mandalorians have a devastating arsenal. We're told that two of the Basilisk war droids are carrying an atomic compression bomb, which is far superior to the antique weapons employed by the craft. The Mandalorians describe themselves as soldiers of fortune, and they've recently made a base in the ruined underground cities of a nearby star system, and they're now looking for more territory. The Mandalorians fight not for power or wealth, but for personal honor. We're told that it is their way, and one might even say that this is the way. Their leader Mandalore finds glory in destruction. Needless to say, their attacks take the Tetans, and more importantly Ulic, completely by surprise. Keldroma watches from a distance as the besieged carbonite smelter crashes to the planet below. Just a point about the art, that Ulic is drawn here wearing this type of face guard, and we can clearly see the cis symbol that was tattooed on his forehead at the end of last issue. He grits his teeth and he says, Mandalore has not even made demands. What does he want from us? Behind him, Alima says, Isn't it obvious, my dear Ulic? He wants the seven worlds of the Tita system. He wants to conquer. I believe he feels a burning need that even he doesn't understand. So Ulic's frustrated. They don't need this distraction right now. He has bigger fish to fry. For example, upholding his part of the bargain with Exar Kun. Alima openly muses that Mandalore likely fears Ulic and his growing reputation, and so this act may have just been a stunt to grab his attention. Very well. Contact this Mandalore, and I will give him the terms of the surrender. Moments later, speaking through a vid screen, Mandalore the Indomitable addresses Ulic directly. I know of you, Jedi Carrion. Will you meet me on the Field of Honor to decide the fate of the Seven Tetan Jewels? Ulic laughs. Nonsense. My armies will rip you apart unless you surrender to me at once. Your warriors still fight with antiques. My clans use advanced weapons. What do you think will happen when you attack us? I'm offering you a chance to deal with me simply, with one stroke of your vaunted lightsaber. Meet me on the planet Kua, on the plains of Hakul, where you and I will battle to the death. Ulic sees opportunity here. Very well, I accept. And if I win, you and all your warriors must serve me. With the terms of the battle set, the scene changes to the Jedi planet of Ossus. In the peaceful gardens of Tala, a powerful figure holds court, persuasively proclaiming a renewal of the Jedi way. Get ready for the alarm bells to go off because this figure is none other than Exar Kun. What? Wait, what is he doing on a Jedi planet? Well, other than maybe some of the masters, it's probably not yet widely known that Kun has fallen to the dark side. It's definitely not known that he's a Dark Lord of the Sith. It's not like he proclaimed it over the holonet or updated his LinkedIn profile. These Jedi are none the wiser to what he has become. So here's what Exar Kun says. My Jedi brothers... No one honors our beloved masters more than I. Indeed, I was apprentice to the great teacher Vodo Siosk Bas, a great historian and gatekeeper of the Tedrin Holocron. I have been fortunate enough to unearth forgotten Jedi secrets, things that were known thousands of years ago, and powers that came naturally to Jedi Knights, forgotten to time. As a true Jedi, I do not intend to hoard this knowledge and keep these force abilities to myself. I want to share them with any true Jedi who will join me. The crowd he's addressing appears to be largely comprised of Jedi Knights and Apprentices, including some we've already met like K. Keldroma and Os Wylam. In fact, Wylam pipes up at this point and basically clarifies that Kun is asking them to leave their masters and make him their new teacher. One of the Jedi that we previously met, another of Master Voto's students by the name of Krado, further points out that Kun is still kind of an apprentice. Master Voto never made him a full Jedi Master. Here we have a side profile of Kun. He still has the three slash marks on his cheek given to him by Kratos' lover Silvar in the Dark Lord's Ark, and he also has that prominent Sith tattoo branded across his forehead. He's looking pretty sinister. He says, I am what I am, Krado, and I must confess, however, that some of the old Jedi, even Master Vodo, are suspicious of my new teachings. They are perhaps losing touch with the times. 
Didn't the late Master Arca let the dark Sith magic escape from his grasp? I sense weakness, indecision. A couple of the Jedi present start to agree with Kun, but Kay and Wylam jump to Arca's defense. Os Wylam tells the others that they went up against the dark avatar of Freed and Nad, and Kay further argues that Arca died bravely and sacrificed himself to protect others. At this point, Exar Kun reveals that he personally took care of Freed and Nad, who had outfoxed the greatest of Jedi Masters. The Jedi present are surprised at this revelation. Kun tells them how he hunted down the evil spirit and went to Onderon in spite of Master Arca's disapproval. Kay and Wylam wonder out loud why Arca didn't like Exar Kun at all. They ask him point blank in front of the entire crowd what Arca was afraid of. Well, unfortunately, Kun uses this line of questioning to further extol his many virtues. He tells everyone present how he succeeded in spite of the Jedi Masters. He found Nad, learned many secrets from him, including the location of hidden Sith artifacts, then he battled Nad, and now the Darksider is no more. Again, Kay tees up a softball for Exar Kun to knock out of the ballpark. He asks Kun to prove it. So Kun pulls out the ancient Sith amulet he wore around his hand in the Dark Lord's Ark, and he tells them to see for themselves, as this ancient, as he calls it, Jedi amulet, will tell all. He reveals that the Jedi amulets were suppressed and forbidden, and that Masters considered such amulets too powerful for young Jedi Knights to use. The amulet he's holding starts projecting an image of Kun using its power to destroy the Dark Lord Freed and Nad. We can see from Carrasco Jr.'s drawings that the Jedi are visibly awed by the power they are witnessing. Exar Kun goes in for the proverbial kill at this point. But I confess I am not content to leave things hidden. I am not content to let great and useful secrets gather dust. If you are like me, if you care about the future of the Jedi, you will join me in my exploration of the most ancient, most wise, and most powerful Jedi secrets. Together we can change the galaxy. With those ominous words left hanging in the air, we switch gears to the planet Kuar. On the open plains of Harkul, Ulik faces off against Mandalore the Indomitable. Ulik wields his trusted lightsaber and the power of the dark side. Mandalore, on the other hand, has chosen a customized Basilisk war droid as his weapon of choice, basically a giant mech or a Metal Gear unit. The stakes are high. If Ulik loses, he loses everything he has worked towards. If he wins, on the other hand, he gains the allegiance of the combined armies of Tita and Mandalore. The plains of Harkul look like something out of Mad Max. Massive chains crisscross ancient structures in an apocalyptic, sandblasted wasteland. With a war cry, Mandalore tells Ulik that his defeat is at hand, and he opens fire on him. But as we learned from Darth Vader, technology, no matter how deadly, is no match for the power of the Force. Ulik quickly uses his lightsaber to deflect the blaster bolts, and he leaps into the air. Calling upon the Force, he launches himself at the war droid and brings his lightsaber down in a devastating slash. Both combatants jump free from the wreckage and find themselves facing off against one another on one of those massive chains I spoke about earlier. You fight unfairly, Keldroma. Put away your bloodthirsty lightsaber. Use this, the simple weapon of my forefathers. Ulik deactivates his lightsaber and Mandalore is handed this axe-like weapon with a half-moon blade at the one end by one of his troops. I can defeat you regardless of the weapon, Mandalore. The battle is met again. The onlookers gasp and cheer as the two warriors put on a display of ferocious power. Narrowly avoiding decapitation, Ulik spins out of the way and grasps a weapon from one of the nearby Mandalorian onlookers. Why not surrender, Mandalore? A warrior knows nothing of surrender. The day will be mine, Jedi. Oh, which day is that, Mandalore? Ulik strikes at Mandalore with devastating power, knocking him completely off of his feet. Looming over Mandalore with the blade at the ready, the battle has been decided in Ulik's favor. A glorious combat, Ulik Keldroma. I cede. My warriors are yours. Now kill me! I'm not interested in your death, Mandalore. I have a better fate in mind for you. A much better fate. So before we can find out what that fate is, the scene changes again back to Ossus. In the vast Jedi library, Nomi Sunrider and her daughter Vima continue their Jedi training under the tutelage of Master Odan Ur. Speaking on the art of Jedi battle meditation, Nomi tells the old Jedi Master that whenever she calls on this power, she feels like she is tapping into a great calm sea with light coming from its depths. Odan Ur explains to her that even though the Jedi must carry weapons and fight in wars, wars don't make a Jedi, kind of like an echo of what Yoda told uh, Luke in Empire Strikes Back. It's the Force that makes a Jedi. Nomi explains how she was tutored by Master Thawne, 
and later Master Arca in the ways of lightsaber battle and Jedi battle meditation. She asks whether those who use the dark side can also tap into the power of Jedi battle meditation. Odan Ur confirms that darksiders can indeed use battle meditation, but it is not seen so much anymore. In the old days, Sith lords would build meditation chambers in their warships. They would seal themselves in the chambers in the heat of battle and direct powerful visualizations upon the conflict that raged all around them. If you remember, this is exactly what Nagasato did in episode 5 of the podcast, something that Odan Ur would have been alive to see. It's also the case in Legends that Emperor Palpatine was apparently doing this during the Battle of Endor in the throne room. You know, this was never explicitly stated on screen, but some materials came out afterwards that says that he was using the art of Jedi, or in that case, I guess, Sith battle meditation. So now here comes the important part, folks. This next part of the discussion is something that you're going to really want to remember as it becomes relevant in our later episodes beyond the Tales of the Jedi stories. Nomi asks what she can do to combat this dark power. Odan Ur explains that she must use her Jedi abilities to take power away from her opponents rather than inflict harm. Essentially what he's telling her is that she can create a wall of light, a permanent blockage, rendering her foe unable to use the force. He tells her that it's the most devastating attack a lightsider can possibly do. Using the force to cut off another Jedi, even a dark Jedi, is a terrible, terrible thing. As it turns out, Odan Ur became adept at such a technique in the days of the Sith Empire's fall. That was when they fought the last of the Dark Lords, when the Jedi and the Republic drove the Sith to extinction. Or so they think. Odan Ur reveals to Nomi that he captured a Sith holocron at the time, the only one in existence as far as anyone knows. He pulls out a pyramid-shaped holocron. Locked within the recesses of the holocron are the forgotten histories and lore of the Sith, dating back thousands of years and more. Oh, what I wouldn't do to get my hands on such a holocron. Anyways. Such forbidden knowledge is dangerous and must be protected at all costs. At that point, we learn that Exar Kun had left the young Jedi Knights to debate his powerful words amongst themselves. He is skulking in the recesses of the library, listening in on the lessons from Odan Ur. Nomi thanks the Jedi Master for his wisdom. In return, he tells her that she is a good and strong Jedi and that her daughter will one day be a great Jedi Master with many apprentices. After Nomi leaves, the Sith holocron begins to grow brighter, and it flies out of the Jedi Master's hands, straight into the outstretched palm of Exar Kun. Odan Ur immediately senses that he is in the presence of a Darksider. Drawing on the light side, he attempts the technique that he just discussed with Nomi. With a mighty force blast, he says, Dark Jedi, you do not belong in this place. Away! Kun stands up and brandishes the amulet. Master, do you really know who I am? I am the Dark Lord of the Sith. Odan Ur collapses under the onslaught of dark side energies. I am old. Evil is loose in the galaxy, and I cannot stop it. Kun walks up to him. Yes, you are old. Old and dead. You should have just given me the Sith holocron. With that, Odan Ur dies and disappears, becoming one with the Force, and leaving the darkest power in the galaxy to walk away with something that will make him even stronger. He leaves his robes behind, kind of like how Obi-Wan does in Episode 4. Kun wonders at this point if Odan Ur would have liked it better being sealed away in a Sith crystal for all time. At that moment, several Jedi, including Ost Wylam and Krato, walk into the room. They tell Kun that they've been looking all over for him, and that he has himself some new students. I guess his words got through to them. They eventually notice Odan Ur's staff and robe on the ground, and they ask what happened. Kun tells them that he was ancient and it was just his time but before he died, he gifted Exar Kun with a rare holocron. Here's what Kun says. He told me it was a fitting present for a Jedi Master. So you see, I am a Jedi Master. Odan Ur has passed his flame to me. I am the Keeper of the Future, and we have great deeds ahead of us. And I promise you one thing. I will never underestimate the power of the dark side. So before we switch scenes, I think it's worth reflecting on how effortlessly Exar Kun comes into knowledge. This guy collects dark side lore like Pokemon. He just keeps getting stronger and stronger. On the other hand, you really have to wonder about the naivete of these Jedi. They've been completely bamboozled. Yes, it's true that Kun destroyed Frieden Nad, but they literally just walked in on him and a dead body, or lack thereof, of a Jedi Master. Given the track record of Exar Kun, why is nobody asking questions? Maybe they're already succumbing to his dark side influence. Maybe they're just young and impatient probably all of the above. In the last scene of the issue, we see the Great Republic shipyard of Forost. 
For centuries, these shipyards have produced a steady stream of advanced warships for the Republic fleet. A ship, pretending to be damaged, hails the shipyards and asks to dock. The comms officer responds that the ship is too large to dock and that they will send someone out to fix it. At that point, the comms officer is told, Don't bother. This ship can't be repaired because it doesn't exist. Once again, Alima has used her illusions, this time, to mask Ulic Keldroma's deadly attack force. With his new Mandalorian allies, Ulic targets the shipyard's control decks and operations centers, while his chaos fighters decimate the defensive stations. The shipyard is soon boarded, and the battle is over before it even begins. The Mandalorians are ruthless and implacable. They carve a bloody path for Ulic, Alima, and Mandalore to the command center, and leave a score of dead bodies in their wake. Ulic asks the men and women in charge for Republic ship command codes. When they are initially denied, Ulic begins to kill people until one of the workers pipes up and tells them that he'll provide the command codes if he'll just stop killing his comrades. At that moment, Exar Kun sends a hollow message to Ulic. Ulic, my half of the bargain goes forward. I have twenty Jedi Knights ready to begin training under my instruction. Ulic responds, Only twenty? I have two entire armies, Kun. And now I have three hundred of the Republic's newest warships. Ulic's eyes betray a dark crimson as he talks to the holographic message of Exar Kun. You can tell that he's pretty evil at this point. Kun responds, Well done. We'll need all that armor for the engagements I have planned. Gather more ships while I train my Jedi. Ulic tells Exar Kun that he plans to attack Coruscant at once. The Republic fleet expects him to attack more shipyards and military outposts, but he plans to strike at the very heart of the Republic. Exar Kun calls him a fool and tells him that he will jeopardize all of their plans. They must slowly build up their forces and attack Coruscant together. Mandalore cuts in at this point. I don't know who you are, but Ulic and I can handle Coruscant. The Mandalorian clans are the best fighters in the galaxy. We don't need to wait for a few Jedi. Exar Kun realizes he's not going to get through and change Ulic's mind, so he relents, telling Ulic to go ahead and prove himself if he must. If Ulic fails, though, he's on his own. Ulic tells him that he's going to prove that the Republic is weak and vulnerable. A true Dark Lord of the Sith would be ready to go to war. With those ominous words, the issue comes to an end. So before we jump into issue 2, I wanted to briefly mention that the Jedi Journal's letters column is back. This letters column, where fans could write into Dark Horse to make their pleasure or displeasure known, was conspicuously missing from the Dark Lord's arc, but it's back. Nothing too interesting to speak of yet, so let's forge ahead. Issue 2 is titled, The Battle of Coruscant. Hmm, I feel like I've heard that one before. The issue opens in the same location where the last issue ended. The Foros Shipyards. One Captain Vanicus of the Republic fleet has been dispatched to answer a distress signal, but all they have found is a decimated shipyard and a whole lot of missing ships. The captain dispatches his people to search through the wreckage for station logs and automated records. Even at this point, the Republic has no idea who carried out these attacks. Captain Vanicus is convinced that this was the work of pirates. We learn that this is the fourth attack of its kind in the past two weeks, so Ulic's been busy. Although most of the computer systems were intentionally fried, Vanicus's men happened to find a recording taken from one of the station's automated security systems. When they activate the recording, a hollow image of Ulic appears, telling his troops to prepare for a surprise strike against Kemplex 9. Captain Vanicus turns to his men. Dispatch all ships immediately to Kemplex 9. I remember this man. He is a Jedi. Our enemy is Ulic Keldroma. We must report this to Coruscant at once. This is a dark day for the Republic. On Coruscant, word has reached the Jedi that a rogue member of their order has been leading terrorist attacks against Republic shipyards. Master Vodo and a small contingent of young Jedi have arrived to convince the Senate to allow them to deal with this renegade Jedi on their own terms. Among the young Jedi that accompany Master Vodo are Kay Keldroma and Nomi Sunrider. Soon after arriving on Coruscant, their worst fears are confirmed. Captain Vanicus's report confirms that the rogue Jedi is none other than Ulic. Master Vodo tells the other Jedi that these are the Sith prophecies come to life. He explains that Keldroma is not acting alone. His apprentice, Exar Kun, is helping Ulic. He blames himself for not sensing this soon enough to act on the information. Yes, Master Vodo, this would have been nice to know the last issue, before Exar Kun started poaching your students. At that moment, the blind Miralukan Jedi Shonev Kulu 
senses a great disturbance in the force. Despite her blindness, she has a vision of a great attack force emerging from hyperspace. Here, we learn that Kemplex-9 was a mere ruse. Ulik had always meant to strike a Coruscant, but he wanted to ensure that the Republic's forces were diverted elsewhere. As his attack ships begin to bombard the planet, the scene shifts to Yavin 4. Kuhn's repaired ship, the Starstorm 1, is just returning from Ossus with his group of Jedi converts. He has promised them powers and secrets beyond reckoning, but none of them seem to fully appreciate the dangers that await them. Kuhn leads the Jedi off the ship. Welcome to Yavin 4, the home of many secrets and forgotten knowledge. No other Jedi knows of this place except myself, and now, all of you. Kuhn leads them through the jungle to a large and imposing temple. Not long ago, this entire place was a jungle wasteland. See this temple I have built? It is only one of many. I am so glad you've come here. After so many centuries, these forgotten techniques will belong to the Jedi once again. Kratos is impressed by the sight of this large temple. He asks Exar Kun what they must do to learn these secrets. Kun tells him, and he tells all the others present, that all they have to do is learn and experience. A Jedi named Zona Luca, a female Vulton, steps forward and voices her doubts. So far, all they've gotten is a lot of talk from Exar Kun. Before we move on, I just want to point out that Os Wylam is another example of a Vulton. Whereas Wylam wears his tendrils kind of coiled around his head like a cap, Zona lets hers hang down, almost kind of like Kit Fisto if you're familiar with that Jedi and in need of a visual. Again though, Google image search is your best friend here. Speaking of Wylam, he chimes in and tells the others that he senses a wrongness to this place. He can feel the taint of the dark side, strong and festering. He declares that none of them should be there, and he decides he's going to go back to the ship. He doesn't want any part of this anymore. On his way back to the ship, Wylam is confronted and surrounded by Masasi warriors. As they begin to move in, he ignites his lightsaber and yells for Exar Kun to call these warriors off. The other Jedi, including Kratos and Zona, join Os Wylam in fending off the Masasi warriors. Interestingly, it looks like Zona is actually sporting a purple-bladed lightsaber. This would have been before Mace Windu appeared on the big screen in the prequels, which makes it even more interesting. Exar Kun ignites both of his lightsabers, the blue blades illuminating him in the dark jungle. He tells the Jedi present to stop. The native Masasi don't understand, and they're merely trying to protect Kun. Wylan repeats that this place is thick with the dark side. He can't understand why Kun is blind to it. Exar Kun disengages his sabers and holds them out to the gathered Jedi. The line continues. No, 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 no. You misinterpret the situation, Oswylam. And I can understand your reluctance. This place does have a great taint of ancient evil. But I have claimed Yavin 4 for the light side. I am purifying the darkness, and I need your help. Please. The Jedi seem convinced, and they begin to deactivate their sabers. Even the Masasi back off and disappear back into the jungle. Kun takes the Jedi back to the temple that he built, and he tells them that he needs their help destroying one of the last remaining shreds of darkness. He pulls out the ancient Sith Holocron, the same one that he killed Odan Ur for last issue, and he displays it to the Jedi. Standing on the foot of the temple, he reveals that this is an ancient Sith Holocron, and it houses forbidden knowledge. He instructs the Jedi to call on the Force and help him destroy the Holocron. The Jedi begin to draw on the Force. With a mighty blow, Exar Kun shatters the Holocron in his hands, causing the shards to fly out in every direction. But we learn that the Sith Lord never intended to destroy, but in fact intended to release. After centuries of imprisonment, locked away in the Holocron, some of the faint remnants of the ancient Sith are freed. While some of these spirits disappear into thin air, others find homes in the susceptible minds of the Jedi. Os Wylam stares at two of the Holocron's shards, buried deep in the flesh of his palm, while dark side energies begin to swirl around him. Like window paints of the past, these crystal shards show him the reflections of Sith grandeur and the glory that must come again. These thoughts, the hunger, and the Sith spirits themselves are absorbed into the young Jedi minds. The crystal shards vanish, now incorporated into the Jedi themselves. Kratō, the only Jedi seemingly not infected, asks what Exar Kun has done to his companions. Kun explains to him that he gave them the knowledge he had promised all along. Back on Coruscant, the planet has turned into one giant battlefield. Valiant Jedi Knights like Dace Diath and Nomi Sunrider help the Republic forces try and repel the invasion. But unfortunately, these Coruscant defense teams have had little experience battling Mandalorian war mounts. 
Master Voto asks Nomi to take him to the war room in the Republic Command Center. He's had a vision that, for better or worse, this is where the battle will be decided. At the same time, we learn the war room is at the heart of Ulik's bold plan. Occupy the war room and crush the heart of the Republic's military command. That's what he has planned. As the battle rages across the capital, Ulik watches on with Alima close at hand. Mandalore approaches Ulik and informs him that all the advanced teams have been successfully deployed. Coruscant was completely caught off guard, just as Ulik had planned. Ulik advises that he intends to move on the Republic Command Center with Alima's illusions, a phalanx of Tetan guard troops, and a hundred Mandalorians. Mandalore is pleased by the prospect. He has heard a rumor that the Republic has been producing new weapons near the command center, and he wants to procure them for his men. Ulik turns to Alima. With this victory, the whole galaxy is going to fall neatly into our hands. Exar Kun will wish he hadn't waited. Back to the battle, we see that Master Voto's escort to the command center has been delayed by Mandalorian warriors. Jedi Knights like Nomi Sunrider, K. Keldroma, Dace Dyath, and Tot Danita engage in a fierce skirmish with their Mandalorian foes. At the same time, Ulik and Alima have entered the fray. Unlike the Jedi, they meet no such opposition. Ulik uses his lightsaber, and Alima summons her deadly illusions to make a brutal path towards the command center. In the same vicinity, Mandalore and a contingent of his troops successfully breach a Republic weapons depot and begin to pilfer powerful new weapons for the cause. The battle continues. Eventually, Nomi reaches out through the Force. She turns to Master Voto and says, Master Voto, Ulik is already in the command center. I can feel him. And the woman. She's there with him. You must be careful. Master Voto replies, A Jedi has broken our way. This is the time to be firm, not careful, Nomi Sunrider. As soon as Ulik breaches the war room, he announces to all present that he comes in the name of the future, a new golden age for the galaxy based on the Sith ways. He instructs the commanders to transmit specific orders that each Republic Admiral is to send their squadrons to the Vento system shipyards. Seeing the Jedi approach the command center, the treacherous Alima finally makes a move. She turns to one of her men and says, Tell Mandalore we are pulling back, immediately. Have him join us at the orbiting command ships. It's time for Ulik Keldroma to deal with his own kind. When Mandalore receives these orders, he balks at first. He's swiftly informed that Ulik is dead, that's a lie, and that the Republic fleet is on its way to crush them, probably also a lie. He's also told that Alima wants Mandalore to take Ulik's place as her new warlord. Seeing the opportunity in this, Mandalore orders his men to take whatever they can and retreat. The Jedi Knights are surprised at the retreat, but they decide to rally and band together. They intend to confront Ulik in the war room. At this point, Ulik is unaware that he's been betrayed by Alima and Mandalore. He's too busy using the Force to choke the life out of a poor Republic soldier. Who else will resist my order? I will, Ulik. Ulik whips his head around to see his brother Kay standing at the entrance of the war room. Nomi and Master Voto are standing right behind him. Kay, Nomi, you aren't supposed to be here. Get out of here, all of you. If you know what's good for you, you'll listen to me. Ulik activates his lightsaber. Now let's pause for a second and talk about Ulik's lightsaber. In issue 1, it's featured as a green blade. In this issue, it appears to be a blue blade. A quick search on Wikipedia reveals that Ulik's lightsaber blade is actually supposed to be yellow in color. Perhaps even yellowish green. So when you're imagining it, it's closer to Rey's lightsaber at the end of Episode 9 than anything else. It's the saber of a Jedi Sentinel. Before Ulik can use his saber, Master Voto tells him that he's finished. His Sith delusions will cause no more harm. Ulik and the guards are swiftly disarmed of their weapons. At the same time, the Jedi combine their powers to use that blocking technique that Master Odin Ur had taught. A temporary wall of light is created, blocking Ulik from the Force. One of the Republic dignitaries comes forth. He kind of looks like a mind flayer. He has all these tentacles where his mouth should be. And he says, Thank you, Master Voto. The Republic has jurisdiction over this man now. Please release him to us. Ulik Keldroma, Jedi and traitor. You will stand trial, and you will be sentenced to death. Wow. Doesn't sound like much of a fair trial, but I guess Ulik's evil deeds are no secret at this point. The last scene in this issue takes place back on the jungle moon of Yavin 4. The scene opens on Exar Kun addressing his newly minted Sith converts. You are now more than you were. Not much remained of the Sith exiles trapped in the ancient holocron, but their residue has joined with your ambitions. Together, we will be unbeatable. 
With fear in his eyes, Kratos asks, But what about me, Exar? Kuhn turns to face him. Stand by my side, Kratos. I have many important tasks for you. These others serve me in a different manner entirely. We must get to our ships. We have a mission. Regardless of how Keldroma's preemptive strike turns out, we must show the Republic and all of the other Jedi never to underestimate the powers of the Sith. The issue ends with Exar Kun's new Sith apprentices, former Jedi like Os Wylam and Zona Luka, looking entranced, their eyes completely white, and their jaws set in grim determination. They are filled with a resolve that may end up spelling doom for the galaxy. Before we cap off this episode of the podcast, there's a fairly amusing piece of hate mail featured in the Jedi Journals. Mr. Colin Yeo Jun E from Kuala Lumpur, West Malaysia, is not a fan of the tales. One of the specific things that he mentions that I wanted to hone in on is Warb Null. If you remember that character, he's King Amun's dark side enforcer with the really, really cool armor. How he barely lasted half an issue. Hey, Colin, I agree on that point. He also complains about how Ulik is featured at the expense of the other Jedi. And for that matter, he's not a big fan of how the Jedi are portrayed. He complains that all they ever do is hack away with their lightsabers. His grievances include the predictability of the storylines, the changing color of Uluk's skin tone, and even how Alima and Satal's space yacht was portrayed in the earlier arcs. Don't get me wrong, he has good points. While some people choose to see this kind of criticism as vitriol, I see it as passion. He's passionate about these stories, almost inversely proportionate to a person who is passionately in love with them. Two sides of the same coin. So with that said, I hope you'll join me next time for part two of the Sith War, and among other things, the trial of Ulic Keldroma. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you.